uh, hi everyone uh, before i start with the talk i'll just cover some uh, tech news that we have so um first of all uh, there's in the news a small startup called clearview ai uh, illegally used a lot of data from uh, facebook youtube and other companies to illegally bolster their facial recognition technology uh, in android news uh, 14% it turns out of android uh, app privacy policies contain contradictions about their own data collection and finally just some uplifting news all of the classic half life games are free on steam so go get them when you can so with that i'll just uh, start with the talk Uh, today's topic is about creating Redux from scratch using RxJS. And uh, Redux, uh, so I'm assuming that you have at least a little bit of experience using Redux, uh, but this talk doesn't assume any uh, prior knowledge about RxJS. So in this talk, what I'll be covering is uh, what reactivity is uh, and what RxJS is. and how you can help uh, uh, implement reactive programming using rxjs and finally we'll try and create our own implementation of redux store using rxjs um and hopefully by the end of this the takeaways will be uh, that you will have a primer on reactive programming the reactive programming style and how to use rxjs in this context and also hopefully some insight into how redux works internally uh to begin i'll just talk a bit about reactive programming you've all heard of uh, functional programming and uh, object oriented programming so reactive programming is uh, just another paradigm just like those other two the point of view of programming in reactive style is slightly different so the point of reactivity is that you write your code in such a way that if something happens you automatically trigger something else uh, now it might seem a bit vague right now what i mean by this later on hopefully with some code samples you'll be able to uh, relate to it better um now before actually going into how we can implement reactive programming i'll touch upon something which we are all familiar with uh which is arrays uh you may call them lists in some other languages but basically they are a collection of data um which we can deal with so for example we have a collection of numbers it's just a sequence of things that you can operate on using operators like map filter reduce and what that allows you to do is deal with collections in such a way that you can write your code declaratively and you can operate on the same sequence and get derived data from that so this style can be called declarative because what you're doing is you're saying i have this and what i want from that what are the derived data i want from that is uh, is received by applying uh, the uh, operations successively on that uh, and you can even clean this up even more if you use helper functions with clearly uh, given names so for example in this case what i'm doing is i have an array and i'm doubling each element of the array filtering out whatever only the even numbers and then summing it up so what i wanted to convey from this example is lists are a collection and you can use operations like this to clearly uh, convey what you want to do and handle collections of data very easily but um the problem with lists or arrays is that they're allocated in memory beforehand so what if you want to deal with stuff which is asynchronous if if it's arriving later on or if it's being produced by user activity uh the most uh, common or simple example would be mouse clicks so this is something that is so common that it's the most uh, basic form of user in in interaction in any app so in in a browser it would be called a click but in a phone it would similarly be a press now let's take an example where we have um, maybe a window and inside that window you have a little square and you want to track how many clicks the user is making inside that square 
So there's many ways to go about this and JavaScript has its own way of dealing with uh, click events. But what if we could represent this, these clicks as an array or a list? Because we already know that dealing with an array as a collection is quite easy. And it's clear what we are trying to do with that. If you were trying to do a uh, deal with individual events using something like a while loop or with timeouts, then that code easily becomes, uh, it gets out of hand and it's not very maintainable. So what if we could represent our sequence of user clicks as an array or something similar, a collection of this shape and then apply those same things we were applying on the array. Um, there is a way to do that and there's a library called RxJS which helps us do that. So RxJS is a very large library. You can think of it as Lodash for events. So I think all of you have used Lodash at some point. It's a very large library that has a lot of functions that help you deal with a lot of stuff. RxJS is like that but uh, from the point of view of events and asynchronous streams in general. I'll cover what I mean by an asynchronous stream in a moment but basically uh, what we get is something that looks like an array. In RxJS it's called an observable and you can generate observables using functions like from event. So what that does is it allows you to give it a DOM node and subscribe to uh, not subscribe but uh, generate an observable from events of a particular type. So in this case I'm saying I want an observable from the event of type click coming from a button. So in this case, the button would be a DOM node, which I, which I get with something like uh, document or get element by ID. So here's a small code snippet. I, uh, in this particular example, I'm getting the event stream of clicks for this entire window. And so, what I do is I create an observable using from event for the entire window for click events and then I subscribe to it. So what a subscription does is it lets you run some code whenever the observable does something. In this case, the observable is a series of clicks which are coming from the window. So as soon as I start clicking on the window, it begins to log because I have a subscription and it's just calling that function which runs every time I do a click event. Now if we want to visualize what an observable looks like, there's a very nice tool called Rx Visualizer and what I've done here is I've used the same thing from event which generates an observable and we can visualize that like this. So the observable is like a line. You can think of it in that way. Whenever I generate events along it, it adds stuff to that. So this looks kind of like an array because you have a collection of things and there's an ordering in that. Now, what if I wanted to operate on the same thing the way I was dealing with arrays? RxJS allows that using this thing called operators. Operators are just functions that can be applied on the data that's coming from the observable. Uh, and the way we do that with RxJS, at least the latest version, is we call pipe on the observable. What pipe does is it gets whatever data is coming through the observable and lets you apply operators like map. What In this case, what I'm doing is I'm mapping over all of the events coming from that observable and I'm getting the X coordinate of that click. So if we visualize that. If I click on the towards the right side, I get a larger number. Towards the left side, I get a smaller number. So this is what the observable basically looks like if we want to visualize it. And similarly, if, if I just try to run that code, so what I, I'm trying to do now is the same thing which I, the situation which I explained earlier, I want to just track if a user is clicking inside a particular box. So the way we do that is we again, we call pipe. 
and we pass map and filter inside that. So it's a bit different from arrays where we have methods on the array. We can just call dot map and dot filter. In RxJS, it's slightly different syntactically. You call dot pipe with the operators fed into it. So as the events are generated by the observable, they'll be fed through pipe and they'll go through each operator in the sequence as and when they are generated. So in this case, if now I click, I'll just refresh this to be sure. So if I click outside, nothing happens. If I click inside, now the click events are generated. What I'm doing is I'm just getting the events from the observable and I'm piping it through a map, which gives me an X and Y, and just an object with the X and Y coordinates. And I'm filtering out those events whose coordinates were inside that box. So I think uh, up until here, hopefully you have a better idea of what an observable is and how we can deal with them. I'll also show you, so like this is the idea. We want to map, filter, and do all of those things on an observable that we can achieve. But if we want to extend the same thing, suppose you have an application and then the requirements change, which happens frequently. And if you are using something like object-oriented programming, it might happen that uh, when you try to scale up or you try to change the uh, code to meet new requirements, you might face difficulties with that. But with reactivity, it can be a little easier, especially if you're using something like RxJS. In this case, what we need to do is, so now what I want to do is, Instead of just tracking single clicks, I want to also, I want to only track double clicks. So triple clicks don't count. And the double click needs to be like two clicks are separated by a certain interval, <coughs> maybe uh, 250 milliseconds. So what I do is I do the same thing which I was doing earlier, but before that I pass the observable data through three more operators. Now, although I've written this a little uh, differently from the actual RxJS style, this is this looks more like what we would do with an array. But if we were doing it with actual RxJS, <coughs> we would do the same thing which we were doing earlier, the map and filter. But before that, we are doing three more steps. So what we're doing is we are buffering, we are filtering out, and then mapping. So the buffering step basically clumps together events which were happening close together. And then I filter out only those which were occurring in pairs. And then I do the rest of the stuff. So if we were to visualize that, it would look a bit like this. So I have my initial click stream. And when I buffer it, it groups them together. When I filter it out, I filter out only those which were occurring in pairs. And then after that, I have a new stream. This is still an observable. So you can deal with it in the same way as you were doing before. And that way you can add additional functionality more easily. But at the same time, your code remains readable. So that's the main thing I wanted to convey. Uh, the other thing is that when dealing with RxJS, you can treat everything as a stream. So although we are dealing with events up, uh, up until now, you could also create an observable from an array or from a promise. So for example, if you have an API call which is returning, you could treat that as an observable and then do the same kind of operations on that. <coughs> now, apart from observables and operators, which we've seen until now, there are a few other things in RxJS that we should probably know. Uh, the first is subscriptions. A subscription is when you say you have an observable and when the observable generates some value, you want to deal with that. So typically in the code, when you're dealing with RxJS, you would write it like this. You have a stream, which is an observable and you subscribe to it with some function. This do something is just a function which runs whenever uh, the observable generates a value. And this is what we were doing earlier. So earlier it was just logging to the console. And the observer is the function which runs when you subscribe to an observable. 
apart from these three things there is a subject a subject is almost like an observable but it helps you deal with multiple observers at the same time and in that way it behaves kind of like an event emitter so you have this subject and it's emitting events and a lot of observers can subscribe to that so to update um, all of the observers you can call this method called dot next on it and you pass a value that value gets emitted and reaches all of the observers there's a slightly different uh, okay so this is just the same thing visualized i call dot next on the subject that value gets emitted subject has a slight um, i mean there's a small variant to subject called behavior subject which is almost exactly the same but also has some internal state so when i call dot next on a behavior subject it will be emitted but also stored at the same time so if you repeatedly call dot next on a, uh, a behavior subject then the latest value the last value which was emitted gets stored and this will be important later on when we try to implement our own state management because we need to, we need a way to store some state and also to allow others to subscribe to it with that i come to state management now i won't go over what it is but the basic idea is you have an app and it has a lot of data which is changing over time and you want a way for the app also the view to change with that and you want a clear cut way in which you can manage all of that changing data uh, when we deal with react a frequently chosen uh, solution is redux and um, redux is like favorable for many reasons in this talk what we are going to try and do is try and implement just the store inside redux going over just the core constructs of redux there's three things the store the reducer and actions and the store itself has some internal state and it provides three main mechanisms or methods one is to get the state at any given point of time which you can get with dot get state you can dispatch actions which change the state of the store so it's store dot dispatch you pass an action to that and you can also subscribe to changes subscriptions in redux are not used that frequently it is used internally by the provider component and these are the things that we are going to try and implement so let's try and do that now what i have here is a sandbox in which i have a to do app it's very basic it has only three functionalities uh, so we can add stuff to it what i'll do is i'll just open this in a new window i've also set up a redux logger so that whenever i dispatch an action i can see how the state is changing with that so i can add stuff i can remove stuff and i can toggle whether it's been completed or not so this is just the run of the mill to do app in fact with fewer functionalities than you would normally implement now in the store itself i am importing something called create store which will help me create my state management mechanism to that i pass a function called the reducer and some initial state which is actually optional and in this case i'm also passing a thing called an enhancer now the reducer is a function Uh, which i have written over here again this only deals with three actions so what i'm going to try and do is implement create store so that i can write my reducer in the same way as i was writing before i can also declare my initial state in the same way and i can use the same middleware that i was using before so what i've done is i've created another directory which is called re redux it's a reimplementation and it has one single export which is create store so that is the thing we are going to try and implement now the store itself will have some initial state i hope this is visible to all of you so it has some initial state i mean it has the state which changes over time so that is a property on the store if we are implementing it as a class if you were implementing as a function then 
maybe the, the approach would be a bit different, but the principles would be the same. So the state is a property and we have three methods, get state, dispatch and subscribe. Now to implement the state, as I said before, we can use behavior subject from RxJS. So what we do is we create a new behavior subject and initialize that with the initial state that we were receiving. So we call this constructor in create store. All that is doing is it's creating a new store with the reducer and initial state. If there is an enhancer, for example, apply middleware, then it creates a store a wrapped store which also uses this middleware and just returns that. So nothing special going on inside create store. But what we need is the functionality inside this class. So we have the state and the reducer is just whatever we are passing in. To get the state at any point of time, we can use the behavior subjects dot value property that just gives us the value which is stored inside it internally. So we just say this dot state dot value. The dispatcher is a bit more complex. It takes a function, the action, this is just an action. So it takes an action and with that, it creates some new state, which is updated into the previous state. So what we need to do is call the reducer with the previous state and the new action, which is received. So I just said this dot reducer with the current state and the action which was passed. And what I do is I say this dot state, which is the behavior subject dot next with the next state. So next, as I had mentioned earlier, not only emits a value, but also stores the value which was emitted. So this will this is our dispatch. And finally, we need a way to subscribe. So subscribe takes a function which is called whenever the state changes. So what we need to do is just call this dot state dot subscribe with that observer. And that is our subscribe. So what I'll do now is go to my store over here. I've imported create store from Redux. All I'm going to do is swap out that one with the create store I've created. I'll just refresh this and hopefully everything will work. So now I can add stuff. I can mark it as done. I can remove stuff. So for some reason, the logger isn't logging properly inside here. If I refresh this, then we can see same actions are being triggered and the state is being updated. So what I've done is I've created my own implementation of the store, which is using RxJS internally. And I've just swapped out create store, which was provided by Redux with this implementation. And everything just works. So from this, what I hope that you learned is that firstly, RxJS can be incredibly powerful for anything. It's uh, whenever you're dealing with asynchronous stuff uh, or events. In this case, we're dealing with events, which are just the actions. And also that Redux is very simple at its core. We just have the state and we have those three methods that we were able to implement using RxJS. And because Redux's API is so clear, I was able to just swap out this one component and still leave everything else. So if you go into the app, you can see that I'm still using uh, React Redux's provider. And inside all of the components, I'm still using connect. All of that still works. The logger still works. So because the API is so clear, that allows me to do that. So up until now, we've been able to re-implement the store of Redux. And this was like, this was a proper implementation. A lot of error handling was not taken into account, but it was doable. What if you wanted to do it in even fewer lines of code? 
Now, in the Redux documentation, uh, there's this um, there's a page called Prior Art, and in that there are sections on various libraries that can be used as alternatives, and one of them is RxJS. And over there, there is a little mention that it's not hard to re-implement Redux in Rx, and some say it's a two-liner using dot scan. So this sort of uh, made me curious and I did a bit of research and found out So I found out that it is possible to do that. I'll just go to the sandbox which shows that code. So, although it says that it can be done in two lines, it can actually be done in one line if you want. This in one line is the entire functionality of the Redux store. Now to explain this, the action stream is just the actions which are coming from the app. And we, what we do is we pass that through scan, which was mentioned, and scan calls the reducer, and then we subscribe the app to this entire, uh, entire stream. So this enables the entire state management to happen. It's happening in one line. What I've done apart from that is just use action creators, my reducer, the initial state and a component in the same way as I was doing before. But from this, I hope you can appreciate how powerful RxJS can be in implementing something as complex as state management. Now over here, I just have this one functionality where I'm adding stuff, but you can easily see how you could just keep adding more functionalities. All you have to do is extend your reducer. Over here, I'm just using the same reducer I was using before. So if I added action creators for remove and uh, toggle, it would still just work. So from that, I hope you can appreciate how powerful RxJS is and also how simple Redux is and how well defined its API is. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you. And from that, I hope uh, you have a primer on like approaching programming with RxJS because that's a library which is quite intimidating. If you go to its website, if you, if you go to its documentation, there's a lot of stuff there. So I hope that by knowing what observables are, observers and subscriptions are, you have a primer and you can pick it up on your own with greater ease. So yeah, that's it for this talk.